Laudetur Jesus Christus. Dear friends, allow me to greet and thank the organizers of the Catholic Identity Conference and all who are taking part. In a moment of great confusion, it is important to clarify what is happening, even by comparing different positions. That's why I am grateful to my friend Michael Matt for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. In this speech, I will not try to give answers, but to pose a question that can no longer be postponed, so that we bishop, the clergy and the faithful can look clearly at the very serious apostasy present as a completely unprecedented fact, one that cannot be resolved, in my opinion, by resorting to our usual categories of judgment and action. The proliferation of declaration and behaviors completely foreign to what is expected of a Pope, and indeed in contrast with the faith and morality of which the papacy is the guardian, has led many of the faithful and increasingly large number of bishops to take note of something that until some time ago seems unheard of. The throne of Peter is occupied by a person who abuses his power, using it for the opposite purpose to that for which our Lord instituted it. Some say that Jorge Mario Bergoglio is manifestly heretical in doctrinal questions. Others, that is ty tyrannical in matters of government, Still others consider his selection invalid because of the multiple anomalies of the resignation of Benedict XVI and the election of the one who took his place. These opinions, more or less supported by evidence or the result of speculation that cannot always be shared, nevertheless, confirm a reality that is now incontestable. And it is this reality, in my opinion, that constitutes a common starting point in trying to remedy the disconcerting, scandalous presence of a Pope who presents himself with ostentatious arrogance as inimicus ecclesiae, and who acts and speaks as such. An enemy who, precisely because he occupies the throne of Peter and abuses papal authority, is capable of inflicting a terrible and disastrous blow, so as no external enemy in the entire history of the Church has ever been able to cause. The worst persecutors of the Christians, the fiercest adherent to Masonic lodges, and the most unrestrained heresiarchs, and never before succeeded in such a short time and with such effectiveness in devastating the Lord's vineyard, scandalizing the faithful, disgusting the ministers, discrediting his authority and authoritativeness before the world and demolishing the magisterium, faith, morals, liturgy, and discipline. Inimicus Ecclesiae, not only with respect to the members of the mystical body, which he despises, ridicules, 
He never ceased to launch poison epithets against it. Persecute St. Sykes, but also with respect to the head of the mystical body, Jesus Christ, whose authority is exercised by Bergoglio no longer in a vicarious way, which would therefore be in necessary and dutiful consistency with the Depositum Fidei, but rather in the self-referential, thus tyrannically way. The authority of the Roman Pontiff is in fact derived from the supreme authority of Christ, in which it participates, always between the boundaries and scope of the goals which the Divine Founder has established once and for all and which no human power can change. The evidence of Bergoglio's identity to the office he owns is certainly a painful and very serious fact. But becoming aware of this reality is the indispensable premise for remedying an unsustainable and disastrous situation. <clears throat> In these ten years of his pontificate, we have seen Bergoglio do everything that would never be expected of a Pope, and vice versa, everything that a heresiarch or an apostate would, would do. There have been occasions when these actions have appeared manifestly provocative as if by his utterances or certain acts of government, he deliberately wanted to arouse the indignation of the ecclesial body and urge priests and faithful to react by giving them the pretext to declare them schismatic. But this typical strategy of the worst Jesuitism is now uncovered because the whole operation has been conducted with too much arrogance and in areas on which not even moderate Catholics are willing to compromise. The sexual scandals of the clergy and in particular the response of the Holy See to the scourge of moral corruption of cardinal and bishop have shown a shameful disparity of treatment between those who belong to Bergoglio's so-called magic circle and those in, he considers adversaries. The recent case of Marko Rupnik is evidence of one who has assigned his power like a despot, Legibus Solutus, who considers himself free to act without being accountable for any of his actions. It often happens that the consequences of the decision taken personally by the Argentine are then passed on to his subordinates, who find themselves accused and discredited for choices which are not theirs. I think of the case of the London building, in which officials of the Secretary of State were involved, while the contract of sale bears the August chirograph. I think of the shameful handing of the Rupnik case, which in addition to having rehabilitated a criminal responsible for horrendous crimes in contempt of the numerous victims, has also discredited the former prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Cardinal Adaria. I am thinking of the Macari case, which with the farce of a secret administrative procedure 
was hastily liquidated without any compensation to the victims and declare res judicata unappealable. And the list goes on and on. It remains evident that the unfortunates who willingly or unwillingly collaborate with Bergoglio find themselves thrown overboard as soon as the press discovers the Vatican scandals. Many are noticing this cynical and utilitarian behavior, which in fact brings them to decline appointments and promotion, precisely so as not to find themselves in an uncomfortable role of scapegoat. The silence of the Episcopate in the face of Bergoglian nonsense have confirms that the self-referential authoritarianism of the Jesuit Bergoglio has found servile obedience in almost all the bishops, terrified by the idea of being made the object of retaliation of the vengeful and despotic satrap of Santa Marta. Some diocesan bishops are beginning to not longer tolerate his devastating action, which undermines the authority and the authoritiveness of the whole church. Bishop Joseph Strickland, for example, has commendably reiterated immutable doctrinal truths that the synod of synodality in the coming months is preparing to demolish. And Cardinal Gerard Ludwig Müller has rightly to recall that the Lord did not give power to the Pope to bully good bishops. Something therefore is beginning to change. Alignments are taking shape, and we see, on one hand, Bergoglio's synodal church, which he emblematically calls our church, and on the other hand, what remains of the Catholic church, towards which he does not fail to reiterate its absolute estranusness. Bishop Athanasius Schneider maintains that any irregularities that may have occurred in the 2013 conclave have in any case been healed in Radice by the fact that Jorge Mario Bergoglio has been recognized as Pope by the Cardinal Electors, by the Episcopate, and by the majority of the faithful. Practically speaking, the argument is that, regardless of the events that may have led to the election of a Pope, with or without external mendling in it, the Church places a time limit beyond which it is not possible to challenge any election if the person elected is accepted by the Christian people. But this thesis is called into question by historical precedent. In 1378, after the election of Pope Urban VI, the majority of cardinals, prelates and the people recognized Clement VII as Pope, even though he was in reality an anti-Pope. Thirteen out of sixteen cardinals questioned the validity of the election of Pope Urban due to the threat of violence from the Roman people against the Sacred College, and even Urban's few supporters 
immediately retracted their election, revoking, convoking a new conclave at Fondi, which elected the antipope Clement VII. Even St. Vincent Ferrer was convinced that Clement was the real pope, while St. Catherine of Siena sided with Urban. If universal consensus were an indefectibly valid argument for a pope's legitimacy, Clement wouldn't have the right to be considered the true pope rather than Urban. Antipope Clement was defeated by Urban VI army in the battle in the Battle of Marino in 1379 and transfer his see to Avignon, leading to the Western Schism, which lasted 39 years. Thus we see that universal acceptance argument does not withstand the test of history. Bishop Athanasius Snyder reminds us that the Via Tutsia, the surer way, consisted not obeying a heretical Pope, without necessarily having to consider him, ipso facto, fallen from his office, as separated from the Church and therefore no longer capable of being at his head, as vice versa, St. Robert Bellarmino believes. But even this solution, which at least recognizes that Bergoglio is a heretic, does not seem decisive to me, since the obedience that the faithful can deny him in only, is only marginal compared to all the acts of government and magisterium that he has carried out and continues to perform without his subjects being able to do anything about them. Of course, one can organize the clandestine celebration of the Catholic Mass. But what can a priest or a layman do when a subversive group of bishops, maneuvered by Bergoglio, is preparing to introduce an acceptable doctrinal changes to the synod on synodality. And what can they do when in their parishes a deaconess blesses the wedding of two sodomites? Certainly, disobeying the illegit illegitimate orders of a heretical or apostate superiors is a duty sub gravi, since obedience to God comes before obedience to man, and because the virtues of obedience is hierarchically subordinated to the theological virtues of faith. But the resulting damage to the ecclesial body is not prevented by an action of simple resistance. The Ruth or the question must be resolved. Thus taking notice of the fact that Bergoglio is a heretic and Amoris Letizia in his declaration of intrinsic immorality or capital punishment would be enough to prove it, we must ask ourselves if the 2013 election was in some way invalidated by a lack of consent. That is, if the one elected wanted to become Pope of the Catholic Church, or rather head of what he calls our Synodal Church, which has nothing to do with the Church of Christ, precisely because it stands as something other than it. In my opinion, this lack of consent can also be seen in Bergoglio's behavior, 
which ostentiously and consistently is anti-Catholic and heterogeneous with respect to the very essence of the papacy. There is no action of this man that does not bluntly have the air of rupture with respect to the practice and the magisterium of the Church. And to this are other the positions taken that anything but inclusive toward the faithful who do not intend to accept arbitrary innovation, or worse, full-blown heresies. The fundamental question hinges on understanding the subversive plan of the Deep Church, with using the method denounced at the time of by St. Pius X with regard to the modernists, has organized itself to carry out a coup d'etat within the Church and bring the prophet of the Antichrist to the throne of Peter. Amens Rea, in infiltrating the hierarchy and ascending its rank, is evident just as it's evident that the plan of the ultra-progressive faction could not stop in the fact that Benedict XVI, whom they considered too conservative and whom they hated above all because he dared to promulgate the motu proprio summarum pontificum. And so Benedict XVI was pressured to resign and immediate, immediately there was ready the unknown Archbishop of Buenos Aires. On the October 11, notice that, on October 11, 2013, in a conference of Villanova University, then Cardinal McCarrick, Bergoglio's longtime friend, revealed that Bergoglio election was strongly desired by a very influential Italian gentleman, an emissary of the deep state to the deep church. Those who work in the Curia know well who is called gentleman par excellence and what he links are, his link has, with the power of both sides of the Tiber, the Vatican and the Italian government. They also know his embarrassing penchant that explains his close connection to the Vatican homosexual lobby. It is also significant that McGarry said he was convinced that Bergoglio would change the papacy within four years, confirming the malicious intention to tamper with the divine and unreformable institution of the Church. St. Bergoglio participated in an event sponsored by the Clinton Foundation after other no less scandalous endorsements from the globalist elite confirms his role as bankrupt liquidator of the Church with the purpose of substituting the constitution of that religion of humanity that will serve as handmaid to the synarchy of the new world order. Ecumenism, ecology, immigrationism, LGBTQ and gender ideology, gender ideology, and other instances of the globalist religion are appropriated by Bergoglio, not only through an action of ostentatious and proud support for the proponents of the 2030 Agenda, but also by means of the systematic demolition of everything that opposes it in the Magisterium and the ruthless persecution of those who express even prudent perplexities. So Bergoglio is heretic and bluntly hostile to the Church of Christ. 
To carry out the tasks assigned to him by the Deep Church, he concealed his most extreme positions, so as to find a sufficient number of votes in the conclave. To ensure total obedience, those who hatched the plan made sure that he was widely blackmailable, as always happens. And once elected, Bergoglio was able to show himself for what he is and begin the demolition of the church and the papacy. But is it possible for a pope to destroy the papacy that he himself embodies and represents? Is it possible for a pope to devastate the church that the Lord has entrusted to him to, de to defend? And again, if a cardinal's participation in the conclave is intended to be malicious, if he intends to subversive act against the church, if the aim is to commit a crime, then even if the procedures and norms of the election are apparently respected, there is undoubtedly a mens rea and this criminal intention emerges from the cunning by which the cardinal, were accomplices to the plot, collaborated in deceiving the cardinals who voted in good faith. I wonder then, are we not in the presence of a defect of, of a defect of consent that affects the validity of the election? I repeat, are we not in, pre in the presence of a defect of consent that affect the validity of the election? Without saying that, the very co-presence of a renouncing Pope and a reigning Pope is already in itself an element that leads us to believe that they have a false concept of the essence of the purpose, considered to be a role that can be shared with others. Let us not forget that the distinction between munus and ministerium is arbitrary and that there cannot be a pope who dedicates himself to the ministry of prayer and another one who governs. Christ is one. The church is one. And there is only one successor of Peter. A body with two heads is a monstrum that is repugnant to nature even before the divine constitution of the church. Some may object. But even if Bergoglio acted with malice, he still accepted what the cardinal offered him. His election as Bishop of Rome and therefore as Roman Pontiff. And so he assumed the office and must be considered to be the Pope. I believe instead that his acceptance of the papacy is invalidated because he considered the papacy something other than what it is. Like a spouse who gets married in church but excludes from his intention the specific purposes of marriage, thus making the marriage null and void, precisely due to his lack of consent. Not only that, what conspirator who acts maliciously in order to ascend to an office would be so naive as to explain to those who must elect him that he intends to become Pope in order to carry out the orders of the enemies of God and the Church. Good morning. I am Jorge Mario Bergoglio. I intend to destroy the Church by getting elected Pope. Will you vote for me? The mens rea lies precisely in the use of deception, dissimulation, 
lies the delegitimization of annoying opponents and the elimination of a dangerous one. And the proof that Bergoglio intended to carry out the criminal plan of the globalist elite is right before our eyes. All desired goals of the emails of John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's right-hand man, had been or have been carried out. From the adoption of gender equality as premise for the female priesthood, to the LGBTQ inclusion, from the acceptance of the gender theory to the participation of the Agenda 2030 on climate change, from the condem condemnation of proselytism to exaltation of immigration as method of ethnic replacement, and at the same time, there is the removal and condemnation of the other church, the preconciliar one, composed of rigid, intolerant people, starting with our Lord, as Antonio Spadaro most famously wrote, and with the cancel culture, applied to faith and morals. There is also the elimination of the mass that intrinsically belongs to that church with Bergoglio considered to be in conflict with the new ecclesiology to the point of prohibiting it as incompatible with the synodal church. So I am, I am throwing the proverbial stone into the pond. I would like that to take seriously, very seriously, the possibility that Bergoglio intended to obtain the election by main fraud, and that he intended to abuse the authority of the Roman pontiffs in order to do exactly the opposite of what Jesus Christ gave a mandate to St. Peter and his successor to do. Confirm the faithful in the Catholic faith feeding and governing the flock of the Lord, preaching the gospel, the gospel to all nations. All the act of Bergoglio governance and magisterius, since his first appearance to the Vatican Loggia, when he introduced himself with his disturbing Buona Sera, as I revealed, in a direction diametrically opposed to the Petrin mandate. He has adulterated and continued to adulterate the Depositum Fidei. He has created confusion and misled the faithful. He has dispersed the flock. He has declared that he considered evangelization of people to be a solemn nonsense. He systematically abuses the power of the Holy Keys to lose what cannot be loosed and to bind what cannot be bound. This situation is humanly irremediable because the forces at play are immense and because the corruption of authority cannot be healed by those who are subject to it. We must take note that the metastasis of this pontificate originates from the conciliar council, from that Vatican II which created the ideological, doctrinal and disciplinary basis that inevitably had to lead to this point. But how many of my confrères who also recognize the gravity of the current crisis, have the ability to recognize this causal link between the conciliar revolution and its extreme consequences with Bergoglio. If this Passio Ecclesiae 
is a prelude to the end times. It is our duty to prepare ourselves spiritually for moments of great tribulation and for the true and proper persecution. But it will be precisely by retracing the Via Dolorosa of the Cross that the ecclesial body will be able to purify it itself from the filth that disfigures it and marry the supernatural help that providence herself for the Church in time of times. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all over the moor. Finally, allow me to remind you that the Exurgia Domini Association I founded aims to give spiritual and material help to priests and religious brothers and sisters who are persecuted by Bergoglian Church because of their fidelity to tradition. If you would like to make a donation toward the re realization of our project, you may do so at the association website or by sending a text message to the number you see below. Laudetur Jesus Christus.